Welcome to American University's 2021 workshop series sponsored by the Measurement and Evaluation Program. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared from our indigenous and native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nacotchtank, Anacostian, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusion and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Welcome everyone for joining us for our workshop on data visualization. Let me welcome our speaker, Dan Meyer. Dan heads Sonic Analytics and staffing sister companies that deliver data analytics solutions and virtual staffing to businesses in the United States and Philippines. Dan, I'm going to go ahead. I know we only have until one o'clock today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you get started. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. So let me start with um, just uh, sharing a little bit about um, my experience. Uh, the, um, the high point of what I do is talking about the power of visualization. It's something that uh, I learned um, early in my career, and I've been doing data analytics um, for about 25 years. And um, it, it's, I think, the most important skill. It, it's something that we've, I think most people have not mastered. And if you look at presentations out there constantly, um, you, you see misused uh, visualizations, you see misunderstood ways people learn visually, and you see a lot of um, just not really effective ways to communicate data. And that's a problem because we live in a day and age where people need to make split second decisions. And so we gotta find ways as visualizers of data to make sure we're giving people um, what they need to learn from our data. And I think a lot of people um, start with a, uh, a, a mistake and, and then they start with the fact that, okay, I have all this data and I need to visualize it. And they're not starting with a point where it's like, I have all this data and I need to let people see what the data shows me. And that difference of like thinking about what your audience needs first is where a lot of people don't quite succeed. And, and what you see is a, ends up with a lot of visualizations that are hard to understand and don't really add a lot of value. Now, I know in your program, you guys do a lot to really try to get into, you know, the data science, understand how to really look at data at a um, very uh, micro level as well as a macro level. And I think that, you know, you probably got one of the best programs in the country from my perspective on, on being trained to use data. And um, I'm sure a lot of you know this kind of stuff. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about a lot of uh, simple stuff. I'm going to zip through some examples. Um, I don't have, unfortunately, the time to actually do a lot of, of going through and showing you things. It just takes a while to build a lot of things. So I'm going to talk about things I've done and share it with you. And if any of you have any questions about, well, how would you visualize this data? Or what's the right visualization uh, for this kind of data? I'd be happy to walk through that offline. So um, if you haven't already, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, and you can always ask me questions that way. But with that, um, let's dive in. Um, and so basically like I start with always thinking about, you know, letting um, data do its work for you. And I always go back to Stephen Few, the first person I ever came across when it comes to the idea of visualizing data. And Stephen Few wrote a book back in 2004 about business dashboards. And he's kind of considered the grandfather of 
what we now see as, as modern data visualization. And he said that data visualization helps us make data speak, provides all the hidden details and covers. It also helps perform the extraordinary analysis quickly, given a massive boost to making the right decisions quickly and confidently. So this is really what we're all about, right? Data visualization should allow us to show people what we see so they can make quick decisions. Um, I'm, most of you are probably going to be doing or are already doing um, duties where you're providing analysis. And analysis really breaks down to how can you share that data? How can you build a story with that data that will influence decision-making? So that's really where I always start when I think about how I'm going to present data to somebody is what kind of uh, impact do I want to have the data have on them? Am I trying to educate them, trying to enable them, trying to empower them? Um, what do I want them to do with the data? And then I, I take that where I start with Stephen Few and I look at your um, mission statement and uh, the information about your program. And there's one thing I pulled out both for data storytelling and visualization is it um, design and evaluation is really what you're all about. And when I think of design and evaluation, again, I ask that question, who is the audience for this? If we're going to evaluate the successfulness of a program, if we're going to understand how effective um, money being spent is, or are we achieving the impact that we set out to, to have with a program we're doing, or is it something that we should think about how to design that so that people, when they look at it, they get it. You've probably experienced it yourself. When you go into a presentation and somebody's presenting, they either get you or they don't really quickly. And you see what happens when people give bad presentations. Um, everyone's like not paying attention. Uh, people like get stuck on things. Conversations go off on tangents because that person that made the visualizations probably didn't really think through um, what the audience really needed. And, and that's where things started to go sideways. So um, designing an evaluation, it's always about who your audience is. It's always about who you in that audience are speaking to, to help them get what they need to do something with the information that you already know. One of the, uh, the, the lessons that I, that I always um, remind myself and teach all my students um, is that you have to always stake, take a second to step back and look at the data and ask yourself, if I didn't know the data, would what I'm saying make sense? So the, the problem we have is we know our data really well and we know what it says. And so we're looking for quick ways to visualize that. And when we don't find the ways that connect with our audience, we lose them. So that's really the central point of, of my talk for the next uh, probably half hour or so. So um, again, my background real quick, I've been doing this for 25 years. I worked for Wells Fargo for uh, the first uh, 15 years of my career. Um, Wells Fargo uh, is obviously, you all know, it's a, a big bank and um, massively data driven. Um, they've done some great things with data and not so great things with data. Um, a, a funny story, I, I know a lot of you, when you hear of Wells Fargo, you think of all the scandals they've had recently where they were doing things like opening up accounts for people and not telling them. I actually saw that kind of stuff happening and was reporting that to senior management and they were choosing to ignore it. Um, ironically. So I left the bank before all that happened. But during my 15 years with Wells Fargo, I, I learned everything possible about how to use data to help decision makers make decisions and doing things like uh, figuring out where in the country we could offer a certain type of checking account to a certain demographic in a certain neighborhood. And getting really, really, you know, at a macro level, starting out and then to a micro level with our data. Um, I was able to understand a lot about how data can really empower an organization. So that's where my background started. I spent the last 10 years actually primarily in the Philippines um, doing uh, training on analytics and uh, being really involved in trying to help that country uh, spread its analytics knowledge um, across the call center industry or business process outsourcing, the BPO industry. Um, it's a booming industry. Um, where more and more companies are looking to the Philippines to outsource things like customer service, um, but also back end stuff like an analysis. So in every call center um, in the Philippines that uh, you could probably think of, uh, anyone who's got, if you call 1-800, you know, whatever, you got a 50-50 chance of getting a call center in the Philippines. I've probably done training for analysts in that organization. 
Um, I also got really involved in doing a lot of education and training. I've taught at a couple of schools. Um, was that a question or is that somebody just not on mute? That was somebody, I, I muted them, so I think we're good. Sorry. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's my background. So I, I, I'm a nerd. I, I know data well. I've always been involved in data. The funny thing is I have no professional training in data um, as far as or ed education. Um, it's all self-taught. Um, I've taken a couple things like a Tableau class here or there, um, but uh, I majored in history and I was a teacher. Um, I have a master's in education. Um, before I got into data. And I just found that it's a skill set that I'm good at. So taking a bunch of data, breaking it down, making it understandable to uh, decision makers is, is what I've built my entire career on. And I think that's really why I speak so much about the power of visualization, because if you can't visualize something and get people to understand it, you're not going to be effective. And if, if no matter how passionate you are about what you're doing, no matter what cause you're supporting, no matter what organization you're, you're championing, um, if you can't visualize your data and make it something people can quickly understand, you're going to struggle. And I've seen that time and time again across all kinds of organizations, across multiple countries. So that's where, where I'm from. So let's just dive into a couple examples now. So today we're going to talk about these things. Um, Tips for presenting data, pie charts, bar and line charts, flow charts, visualization tools, compelling data visuals, and briefly data storytelling. For those of you that didn't catch my previous talk, I gave about a month ago, it's out there on YouTube, um, but I talk about data storytelling. So traditionally, I actually teach data visualization before data storytelling. It just worked out in a fluke that we did it reverse order this time. But um, I always see data storytelling is primarily taking data visualization to the next level. So everything I talk about today um, will also help with the goal of being a better data storyteller. Um, I start with two examples of visuals and I know you can't read that, it's really tiny, um, but that's on purpose, right? That's the, uh, um, I'll, and I'll go into the slideshow now so we can see the whole thing. Um, so this is like the worst pie chart I've ever seen. And I just, you know, randomly Googled bad pie chart and this is like a breakdown of, of sales by um, movie house in Ireland. I just ran, but look at all those things. You can't make any sense of it, right? I mean, you can kind of guess that Sin World 17 and View Liffey Valley 14, um, they're bigger than everyone else, but what the heck does that mean? And is this really value at all? It's like a perfect example of where you don't want to go with a visual is providing dis useless information to somebody. Another example about visualization we'll cover really is the use of color and structure. I can't overemphasize the importance of thinking about the color and the structure and the, the way your data is presented on how it impacts the audience. Just real quick, a, you know, a visual here, um, it was a survey um, that I just again pulled randomly off Google um, and you have the brown and it's not ranked um, in any particular way. It's actually alphabetized um, by a uh, question. Um, and then you have it on the, on the uh, right side where it's blue, all blue, and it's ranked by the one with the most answers. Simple things like this get overlooked a lot because we're rushing, because we're trying to meet deadlines, because we're not, again, thinking about the impact our visuals will have on our audience's ability to understand them. So color is very, very underappreciated um, when it comes to visualization. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then how you actually structure the data, how you sort it, how you display it makes a big difference as well. So um, with that in mind, we'll dive into uh, visual learning um, as really the key component to start with. So if you do any research on how people learn visually, you'll see there's this tons of data and this is something that I, I preach a lot about, is that when you're presenting data, you have to understand how people receive the data. And it's really closely tied to understanding the science behind how people learn visually. So when you're presenting data, you wanna ask yourself first and foremost, can people quickly make sense of this? There's a lot of studies out there that will say things like, if you can't get someone's, if they don't understand something in the first couple seconds, you lose them and they stop listening to what you're saying and they focus on what they're trying to make sense of. 
So for example, if you have that really ugly pie chart um, with like a hundred plus slices of the pie um, and you're talking about how important your research is, you're talking about how you're able to uh, use grant money to do X, Y, Z, you're talking about all this important stuff, but everyone is still focused on that pie chart. They're not listening to you. They're trying to make sense of that mess of a pie chart. So understanding how that visual learning plays into uh, visualization is super important. There, you know, I've seen different numbers, but approximately 65% of the population um, are primarily visual learners, right? So no matter what you say, no matter um, what you're doing to emphasize a point, they're looking at the visuals. And this is why we use visuals. This is why it's so popular for us to take a bunch of data and put it into a pie chart or a line graph because most people look at a spreadsheet or a database and they just, their eyes glaze over. One of my most successful um, points in my career at Wells Fargo was when I worked for a guy who hired me for this primary reason. He brought me in on, onto his team because he said in the time he interviewed me, um, I hate Excel. Um, I never want to learn Excel. And whenever I look at you know any data in Excel, it just makes my blood pressure go up. So I need you to make me understand what's in the Excel documents or into the data underneath Excel um, without me having to ever open another Excel again in much of my life. That's really what he told me. And it really stuck with me because most people are like that. We are the few, actually, the people that are on this call, the people that are involved in this kind of program, the people that care about the data and the analysis of data, um, we're basically nerds. And we're basically doing this because we enjoy it. And most people don't enjoy it. And they're not nerdy about data. So we have to think about that when we present visuals. Um, also, there's plenty of evidence that audiences remember information better and better recall it when it's represented both visually and verbally. So when we're presenting things, this is where we wanna to speak to our slide. We want everything on our slide to speak to what we're saying. We don't wanna disconnect because if we do, if what we're talking about doesn't match what people are seeing, we're gonna lose part of our audience. So you always wanna think about that when you're doing a presentation, when you're showing data, um, that it fits what you're talking about. And then of course, when or audiences see organized graphics, um, the critical thinking skills are enhanced. You actually, increase a person's ability to understand something when you pick the right visual. So visualization really is, is it's very scientific. Um, I, I'm sure in your courses, you, you have a lot of theory that you understand, you do a lot of practical application, um, but if you haven't, spend a little time just researching how people learn um, visually, because that's gonna be really important when you present data understanding the audience, understanding how they're going to consume the information you share with them. So you pick the right data and the right visual to hit them right where they're at. That's what's made me so successful is I've been really good at figuring out an audience and designing um, a presentation for them based on what I think the data tells me that they need to know. So there you go. Um, Let's talk about some, some good and bad about data and why we should do certain things. Um, one thing that I always start with is I always look at how, again, people can see information. Um, there's a reason why uh, eye charts are black on white. There's a reason why most books are black on white. Originally, it probably had to do with cost of color and so forth. But bottom line is our eyes are trained from a young age to make sense of black text on a white background or any kind of dark text on a very light background, if you want to mix it up. Um, but what we do not see in our lives very often is uh, light text on a dark background. And that throws us off. It causes you know, some cognitive dissonance in our head when we're trying to make sense of things. And again, there's plenty of science on this. So as much as possible, you want to always do presentations of data whenever you're using text like this. You want to make sure it's a dark or black color text or uh, information over a light background. You want to minimize the use of color and you never want to put dark text, I mean, dark uh, light text on a dark background. Um, people fall in love with what they, what they think is intriguing, what's cool, what they like. Like if you've ever seen a presentation where someone was so into what they're doing, 
but they put like a pink text on a blue background and your eyes can't make sense of that, you see how quickly that can get lost. So starting with this, before we actually even look at presenting data, think about how you're displaying any kind of text or narrative or anything you're doing around that data. You also wanna think about how do, uh, again, people process information, what makes sense. So having you know your most important elements in the top left-hand corner, where most of us start to read. So your most important visual on any presentation should be the very first thing you see in the upper left-hand corner, um, because that's where people are gonna like focus on. They're gonna go right there. Now, if you want to lead them through a path and have them look at data over time, you can do that. And, and it can either be you know uh, from left to right or top to down, that will work. But if you put your most important data elements at the bottom on the right side, you're gonna lose people. So again, this is just tips for basic visualization. So one thing that I always do whenever um, I'm gonna talk about data presentation, data visualization, is just kind of quickly Google what's out there and look what experts are saying, look what people are talking about. Um, and you can find literally thousands and thousands of YouTube videos from experts. You can find an unlimited number of blog posts and articles from companies and individuals and influencers who talk about how to present data. Um, and I just pick this one randomly. Um, as a talking point to look at how people are looking at data. Um, one suggestion by this uh, Vinipa Vinigage, it's a consulting company that specializes in presenting data, um, combining different types of visuals, use icons, use bold fonts, right? So again, thinking how to get away from traditional pie chart, text, PowerPoint presentation. What can you do to mix it up? Especially if you're involved in doing anything on social media right now. Um, if you think about what makes effective social media, if anybody here is like on Instagram and you, and you make or watch people that make a lot of reels that have a lot of you know really cool pop-ups and animation, they're quick, fun things, and it's limited to about 30 seconds, where TikTok is so popular right now because it's really short, quick things, you start seeing that we're really mixing up visuals. We're really trying to find emojis and stickers and icons and things that grab attention. Um, we're using big, bold fonts in all we're doing on social media. But a lot of us don't do that in our PowerPoints because it's not professional, but we're losing where people are at. So when I look at ways people are talking about presenting data, I kind of look at those things that grab attention and I pull from social media certain things that I think pop. Um, picking colors uh, is super important. Um, there's a lot of, of people out there right now that are moving towards trying to change the colors in Excel, the default colors, um, when they do presentation, uh, to look for colors that are either brand specific colors or colors that are more easy on the eye. I'll talk about those in a bit, but there are certain colors that you should and shouldn't use in visualizations. Um, I, talk, I talk about how to make, uh, how to show the parts of the whole, right? So if you're if you're gonna walk somebody through a presentation, you're gonna show multiple visuals, or if you're building a business dashboard, or if you're using a business dashboard to tell a story, um, you wanna think about how this whole thing comes together to the whole, you know, do you have a point? And this is where we really kind of get into the idea of data storytelling and storyboarding, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but the idea is that you wanna give people a chance to learn over time. You're not randomly showing them things that don't have some kind of flow or connection. Um, you wanna also find a way to focus on the key point. When I talk about data storytelling, um, it's the big takeaway. I talk about data visualization, it's that amazing statistic. What is that one thing that of all your data, of all your analysis, you want them to get, you want them to walk away with? And that's what you really wanna kind of like go to a couple times. In a sense, you wanna think about how you're trying to sell to your audience, your solution, your idea, your discovery that came from your analysis of the data. And that should be your most important visual. That should be the thing that you use, talk about probably in the beginning, the middle and the end in different ways, but you want them to walk away from that presentation with that thing that you want them to do, that call to action, that discovery, that something that's innovative, something that's gonna change things. That's what you're looking for when you want to visualize data. Um, you can also think about how to uh, optimize infographics and visuals for mobile. Um, a lot of think people now are using more and more mobile devices for presentations. The idea of a corporate presentation or a, 
traditional organization or government presentation isn't going to go away. We're still going to be using PowerPoint for probably forever. But more and more people are looking at things on their phone or a tablet versus a laptop um, or a computer. So you want to think about how you can optimize things. Um, Tableau, for example, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, is really good at helping you design visuals that translate well between devices. Um, getting away from bullet points, even though I have bullet points here, which is boring, um, or numbers on a lot of my stuff, I, I, as much as possible, you want to look for icons. And then eventually you want to tell a data story. So if you talk to any expert um, in the field of visualization, they're all talking about data storytelling. And have visualization is a step towards doing data storytelling. So at this point, I've thrown a lot out there. Um, anybody have any questions or, or things that I that I they maybe didn't quite get? I went through some things pretty fast. So there's no questions that have popped into the chat yet. Okay, cool. So pie charts, real quick. Um, pie charts are evil. Don't ever use a pie chart unless you absolutely have to, and only use it if you're going to slow two slices. Think about that. How many of you have made a pie chart in the last couple of days? where you had seven, eight slices on the pie. And you were trying to show things like in this, um, what percentage of uh, website traffic is organic? Um, you're showing all the things like, you know, so organic uh, social media accounts for 10% and organic search 45%. Well, there's a rule of two. I first heard this from a woman in Cole Nathlet, who I'll talk about in a bit. Um, pie charts, if you have to use them, you only use them when you wanna show two data points and the data point you want to emphasize is the one that you put in color when you make with big bold fonts and you do things to call out attention to show that 45 percent of web tra website traffic is organic search in this example everything else if you want to put it into a visual don't put it into a pie chart put it into a bar chart or a line graph something where people can look at things and compare them easier pie charts the more slices you have, the more confusing it gets. Um, like, is there really a big difference between referrals and email marketing? They're both 15%, but they're just 5% more than paid social media or organic social media. So it's really kind of hard to see, you know, what you're going for there. Um, pie charts, again, they're the first thing we learn. They're the ones that everyone knows how to do in Excel. They're the ones that everyone expects to see but they're the ones that actually throw us off and make people stop and question and try to make sense of. If you have the pie chart on the um, right, it's easy to make sense of. It's basically telling you 45% of your website traffic is organic search. If you look at the one on the left, you're, you're trying to figure out now what is what, which matches to which color, and, and you just lose the person, right? You lose your audience because they're trying to do the math, they're trying to figure out what's what, they're trying to draw conclusions, and they block out anything you say because they're trying to do that all in their head. So pie charts are evil. A couple of the things of pie charts, though, if you have to use them, um, again, look for ways to use simple coloring. This is blue and white, right? Two simple colors. It's not a very bold, it's kind of a, a little darker, a little more nuanced blue, um, but the fonts are big. And then you can do things with pie charts like make them even better, like using like things like donuts. Um, so if you have to use a pie chart because you think it's the best one, um, Keep it minimal, keep it big, easy to understand, and don't complicate it. That's my, my thought on pie charts. And I think this is what you're gonna find a lot of leading experts in visualization talk about is that pie charts are kind of our own worst enemy when we're doing presentations. So I'm sure all of us have done this, right? Recently, we've made pie charts and then we're like, it makes sense to us because we can understand the data and we know what everything is before we, we when we build it. But we put it in front of our audience and we see, glaze over their eyes. We see them trying to struggle to do the math. We're trying to noticing them not paying attention to what we're saying. It's probably because we used a really bad pie chart. So, all right, bars and line charts. Um, so there's this great thing I, I saw today uh, and I was when I was preparing for this and I threw it in my presentation. Um, there's this Medium blog and, and there's a um, link here, um, basically and links by Vidya. And, and it's a, uh, a medium um, page uh, where it's a person talking about how to do you know, really good visuals. And this is an example. When we do bar charts and line charts like these, they're all bad because we're just throwing a bunch of random colors. We're throwing, showing things that don't make a lot of sense. We're using the wrong uh, labeling on our axes. I could spend 
literally a day with you talking about how to do better bar charts and line charts. Um, but what I would suggest is use your time later to actually go out and think about that. Take some of your bar charts or line charts you've created and ask yourself, um, do the colors make sense? Are they ranked in a, in a way that makes sense? Are they logical? And then go out there and search for experts and see how they do it and compare what you do to what they do. And you're probably going to see that there's some room for improvement in how you're ticking to do bars and, and line charts. Bars should really be used to explain uh, comparisons, to show which one is bigger, which one's more successful, which one's had more impact. Um, and, and they should be done in ways that you take the color and you minimize it so that the only the darkest, boldest color is what you want people to see. And everything else is kind of window dressing. Um, if you make them look at bar charts, like with pie charts, and you make them try to figure out what makes sense, it may make sense to you, but if they got a struggle, you're going to lose them. So uh, bar charts and line charts are really important. Um, they're like pie charts. They're something that we all learn how to do really easily. There are plenty of tutorials and experts out there on YouTube talking about how to use them. And I'll, I'll share with you the best. So if you want to go watch with somebody, somebody who's just a master at visualizing within Excel, Leila Garani, um, follow her on YouTube if you haven't, or haven't heard of her already. Um, she's got into doing a lot of things besides Excel, but she started as kind of like an Excel, Excel guru about 10 years ago. I, I've met her a couple of times. I've seen her speak. She's amazing. Um, but she's got some great videos on how to make a better bar chart, how to make a pie chart that actually works. So if, if you want to find an expert to compare what you're doing to what somebody out there is doing, um, check out her channel. Um, I, I don't know any better, anyone better out there who's using Excel to make amazing visuals. So um, Lila's pretty cool. I would definitely check her out. And this is where I, again, would, would take what you're doing and compare it. I wish we had time. If we were in a class where I would have you know you for a day or so, um, we would actually do some uh, examples, right? So I'd assign you like some data and say, okay, make some visuals. We talk about it. We share it with a group. We get feedback. Um, I encourage you to do that. Always get feedback. Always compare what you're doing. Always put a second pair of eyes on your visualizations before you share it, especially if it's your data and you're the one that understands it and you're the one that's gonna present it, are you gonna make sense of it to your audience? Can they follow what you're saying? Ask somebody else before you share it. Or if you're going to provide data analysis to somebody that you're not gonna share, talk to them about once they get that data and have a conversation so they understand as much as, as you can. A lot of times what we do with analysis especially if we're reporting with our data, is we just create a bunch of data, put some visuals together, which makes sense to us. We push it out to a distribution list or share it to a manager or a decision maker, and then they get it and they go to a meeting and then they can't explain it. And then the whole process just leads back to you to have to go back and do more work. And this happens all the time. I'm sure it's happened to you where you thought you nailed something with your data. You figured something out, you discovered something, you identified something, and it got lost in translation between you and the person that need to make a decision. Um, having great visuals, learning from experts is a way to get around that. Um, flow charts, a couple, three uh, key things about flow charts. And I love this, this flow chart here. It's actually done as an infographic, um, but write out your core concepts for flow charts. Your flow chart, you wanna build a storyboard of it. Your, you know, your flow chart is like a storyboard. You want to lay it out. You want to make sure you think about how you design a flow chart, especially if you're showing how a process works. Money comes in here because we had a grant here because we wrote the grant here. And then when the money comes in here, we spend it here and we track it here and we do all these things. So build it out into a flow chart before you build a flow chart, if that makes sense, right? Think about how you lay it out. And then separate things. A lot of times with flowcharts, the biggest um, problem I see with flowcharts, including this one here in this visual, is it's got a lot of steps to it. Maybe it would be better if we broke it down into a couple of different visuals. So we're not trying to overwhelm our audience. Now, if we're gonna stick on this one visual for our entire presentation and walk people through it step-by-step, step, that's okay. But if this is just one part of a process, or if we're going to share this plus a bunch of other information, and we try to get people to follow this, it's going to be too much. So it, again, depends on what you're trying to do with that flow chart. If your flow chart is all you're going to talk about, you can optimize it and put it all in one view. But if your flow chart is part of something bigger, and it's just part of your process to show how it works, how money comes in, how it's spent, how it's tracked, how it's reported, the impact it has, whatever you're trying to do, 
those may be better uh, separate flowcharts. So write out your concepts, make sure you think about it. Whenever I'm doing presentations, I always scratch out a storyboard first. I always think about what are the key elements. When I start a presentation, a PowerPoint, I, I think of my bullet points and I make a slide for each bullet point. And then I go through and make sure I've, I've covered every slide. You, presentations should have a bit of a story arc to them, right? You, you wanna introduce yourself as the expert in some way, introduce why your data is important in some way, introduce the problem you're trying to address, and then talk about the analysis and then come up with a conclusion or a solution or a call to action. So whenever you're doing presentations of data, they should follow some kind of narrative. That's why data storytelling is so important. All right, so I'm gonna keep moving along. Um, infographic. I do, have, I do have one question here. Um, so the question is, how do you know under what circumstances you would use a specific kind of graph? So it's whether it's a line graph or a scatter plot or a bar right. graph, how do you know what to use in your work environment? So first and foremost, you ask yourself this question. If I show a scatter chart to my audience, are they gonna make sense of it? Are they um, data savvy enough to look at a scatter plot or a scatter chart and, and see something behind it? I'm gonna say in most cases, no. In most cases, most audiences, they look at scatter plots or scatter charts and, and they just go like, that's a lot of bubbles, it's a lot of dots. They don't figure out how to make sense of it. So if you're gonna use it, cause you have to make sure that you explain it. Assume your audience isn't gonna understand it. So bar charts, line charts, pie charts, that's how we go to those because people are used to seeing them. So again, if you start with how, how um, comfortable is your audience with looking at the visuals? And if you don't know, you can ask, you can get feedback, you can you know, ask for suggestions, um, but you have to figure that out because if you just throw a bunch of visuals together, especially visuals that are not common in presentations, then you'll lose most of your audience. So um, another way to answer that question is like, uh, make, make a couple different versions of it and compare, right? You know, so do a pie chart, a line chart and, a, and a, a scatter plot and see which one makes more sense with that data. And over time, you'll get used to knowing which ones are the best, both which ones are best for you to make, to convey the data, as well as which ones make the most sense to your audience. It's all about finding ways to connect. So um, the other thing you could do is, is go out there and ask experts, right? So. Again, you feel free to whenever you want. Link, you're going to reach me through LinkedIn. Um, go out there and follow Layla. You know, do things where you're following experts um, and ask their opinion as well. So, hope that helps. All right, infographics. Infographics are. I'm going to talk about this real quick because I love infographics. Um, PictoChart is the um, one that my team and I use. Um, infographics are data arranged sort of presented visually. Infographics are fun. They add uh, a little bit more of a flavor to it than just a traditional PowerPoint presentation. Um, infographics allow us to do kind of cool things. This is an example of a map, and I'm gonna zip through these real quick, but I'm a big NBA fan. This is a little bit old, but this is a, uh, a map showing um, the number of uh, fans in a zip code um, for NBA teams. And the darker the color around that NBA team, the um, deeper the fan base, meaning the higher percentage of people in that face, in that place. Um, and it's, I think it's really cool because you can see that Laker fans are all across the West Coast. Uh, there's a significant number of Laker fans. It makes sense. They're the most popular team in the NBA. Um, and then you see pockets of areas where there's not a lot of, of significant fan bases because there's no team or it's just a wide open space. But finding ways to use infographics to make visuals. This is a cool map. I love maps. I talk about this a lot. Maps are the key um, way to get decision makers to understand any kind of strategic thing where you're you're trying to understand uh, demographics, you're trying to understand uh, projections, you're trying to look at things that over time that are gonna impact any kind of geography, uh, maps are great. Tableau um, is a beautiful tool when it comes to mapping. Again, infographics showing which NBA team um, has had the most winning seasons, the most successful NBA team based on the size of the logo, simple uh, data visual, um, number of uh, winning seasons per franchise, the bigger the circle. Um, the bigger the logo. Um, finding ways like this is outside the box. I think for a lot of us, when we think about how we do presentations, especially within you know evaluations and metrics and measurements and so forth, but learning some of this visualization stuff that's not traditional 
um, can help us figure out ways to make things pop even more. Um, so when you look at this, I didn't have to probably even tell you that the bigger the circle, the more uh, successful that the franchise is. You probably know that because one, they're bigger. And two, just even if you're not a, a basketball fan, you know the Lakers and the Celtics are, are two of the more popular teams. Um, so it makes sense without you having to think about it. And when I say actually, the bigger the circle, the more um, successful the franchise over time, it, it makes sense. So there's no cognitive distance here. You're not sitting here trying to guess what it is. It intuitively makes sense to you. This is something that you can learn from doing infographics. Another quick one I'll uh, do. This is an example of a lot of data um, that someone put into an infographic. It's about the Philippine tourism industry. Um, this is pre-pandemic, of course. It shows like things like, you know, how much money is generated, which countries contribute the most uh, tourism, uh, what are the top food cuisines in the Philippines, um, how much is contributed by the number one resort in the Philippines, um, Boracay. There's about, you know, 10 data points here, all in one visual. And it works because it gives you a chance to kind of think about it and everyone can kind of go their own way and, and almost like a smorgasbord uh, or a buffet of uh, data. Now, if most of us would have done something like this, we would have created a 10 slide PowerPoint and we would have walked our people, our audience through that presentation slide at a time. And we probably would have bored them and some of the people would have got stuck on one thing, but this way everyone can kind of look at it at once and you can open up their questions. You can walk them through a narrative. You can have people interact. It just sometimes infographics are a good change of pace, a different way of doing things. So that's my point there. Um, real quick, I'm going to talk about Tableau. I, most of you are using Tableau. Awesome. Tableau is by far and away the best data viz tool out there. There are other ones that do some cool stuff, but Tableau was the first. They're the biggest and that's they're, they're managed to stay, I think, on the cutting edge. Um, when it comes to Tableau, uh, a lot of the visuals, it's, it's not necessarily intuitive when you first start, but once you get it, um, you can really go. And I wish I had time to walk you through some visual on Tableau. Um, this is what I trained my team on. Um, I, I've taught on Tableau. Um, it's just like my, my love. So I love Tableau. Um, I talked about this before. I did a storytelling class about how to do best visual tools, but I'm going to zip through things. I'm going to talk about Dr. Zelker real quick as an example of how visualization of data makes a difference. So Dr. Zelker was a client of mine a while back. And Dr. Zelker is a chiropractor. Um, and he's a chiropractor who has a business located in Pleasant Hill, California. And he's been in the same place for 25 years. So I'm gonna tell you how the power of data visualization really helped Dr. Zelker make a decision and how I was able to, as a data expert, show him the data that helped him figure out what to do. So real quick, Dr. Zelker contacted me through a mutual friend because he was struggling in his business. His business had started to decline. He was uh, not seeing as many patients. Um, his the patients had left or, or weren't coming back. And he was trying to figure out how does he get back to where he was making um, more money, having more patients and being more successful. So taking some just simple metrics, I was able to create a data story um, using the visualization and Tableau to help Dr. Zelker figure out what to do for his business. So we started with demographic profile. So the, taking the 2010 census data, um, we looked at Dr. Zelker's physical location in Pleasant Hill, California. Um, we did this because we asked Dr. Zelker, who were his clients? We asked him for a demographic profile, basically, off the top of his head, were most of his clients from a certain age range, a certain uh, gender, a certain ethnic uh, makeup, a certain education level. We just asked him a bunch of questions, and he gave us his, his guesses. And we started comparing that to data that we found on the census website, for example, looking at um, Dr. Zelker's location. So Dr. Zelker in Pleasant Hill, in his zip code, um, it's a fairly diverse environment, um, and yet Dr. Zucker's clientele, and I don't think this was on purpose, it's just kind of the person he was and the place he was doing business, was predominantly white, but the neighborhood around him is not predominantly white. So understanding how to maybe mix up his marketing a little bit, to think about more how to outreach to other groups would probably help Dr. Zucker. So that was the first thing we discovered. We also looked at, you know, things like uh, in the neighborhoods around him. So in Pleasant Hill, California, um, there's a certain population. And then you look at the two or three closest zip codes to his zip code in Martinez and Concord, we started seeing that they're much younger than his average customer age, um, that there are more uh, um, people with young children, 
that there was a higher level of income in his area versus other areas. So he wasn't able to necessarily draw, not just in his zip code, but in the zip codes around him. So we took all this data and we analyzed it. And our goal was to show Dr. Zelker um, our findings in a way that made him go, hmm, I need to make some changes in how I'm marketing my business. The other thing we wanted to bring into this was competitive analysis, right? So we looked at Dr. Zelker and I even asked him when we first met, how many competitors do you have? In like a, a five block, you know, radius or um, five mile radius, so not five block, it's a typo. Um, within a 15 minute drive or so uh, of your office, how many other chiropractors are there? And he thought there was about 30. Um, just off the top of his head, he guessed that. There were actually 80 when we did a, just a simple Google search on chiropractors, Pleasant Hill, California. Um, so there was a lot of competition, much more than he thought. And also we looked at his pricing. We did some you know, mystery shopping. We figured out you know, what his average price was for a neck adjustment and then compared that to other people we called or looked on their websites to find out their average prices for neck adjustments. Bottom line, we took all this data and we were trying to tell Dr. Zucker he needs to diversify his marketing. He needs to reach out to other communities. He needs to lower his prices and he needs to be talk about how his competitive advantage is the fact he's been in business for 25 years, that he knows what he's doing, that he's been around. So we take all that and then to show him this, we wanted to be able to solve a problem by showing him what he needs to do. We looked at some demographic data, um, medium household income and number of competitors on a simple Tableau uh, map, right? This is like very elementary Tableau. And the idea here is that in his zip code, right in the middle, 94523, he had eight other competitors and around him, he had 80 competitors all within a 15 mile radius. And the area he was in was kind of middle class and the areas around him were more upper class or lower class depending on what he was doing. So if he's gonna target his marketing to a certain demographic, it would help him to understand this breakdown. So we recommend Dr. Zelker that he do more outreach, that he do uh, more marketing in certain zip codes and he was much more successful after doing that. So the idea here is using the power of data visualization to be able to help a decision maker make decisions based on data and analysis with a visual. We showed him this map, he got it, he understood, he was able to see the challenge before him. It was much more competitive than he thought it was. And that was really the key takeaway. So a couple of things I wanna share with you real quick. And I, I know I have to wrap this up pretty fast because I gotta catch a flight, unfortunately, soon. Um, Couple more resources. Uh, Cole Nafik, she is like my favorite person in the world when it comes to storytelling. And her keys to storytelling are visualization. I mentioned this on my data storytelling talk, but if you haven't read her book or if you haven't followed her, um, uh, you should. Um, she, I think she's now working directly with Cornell and doing classes through them. Um, but basically, uh, she talks about simple is better, simplistic, right? Uh, she's the best I've ever seen at taking a visual and breaking it apart and redoing it in a way that makes much more sense. Looking for colors that are easier on the eye, ranking things, making things that are logical for the audience. This is super important. And Cole's the best at doing that. So she will teach you how to enable people by giving them information the way they need it to understand it better. That's the key, number one, of data visualization is you wanna figure out how do you enable your audience to see what you see. If you can do that, then you can do more stuff. If you don't enable your audience to see what you see, then no matter what you say, they're gonna be lost. They're not gonna get it. So always think first and foremost about how are you enabling your audience to understand through visuals what you already understand. Number two, educate with data visualization, right? So educating, Dr. Hans Rosling, he passed away a few years ago, but he was the master at visualizing data in storytelling ways. Um, if you check out his YouTube video on the rise of Asia, it is the best example I've ever seen of how you take a very simple data point um, showing uh, income and lifespan in different countries and how Asia was catching up to the West throughout the last 15 years, um, as far as economically, based on the fact that people are living longer and having more money and how countries in Asia kind of have become much more significant economically. He did this with two data points and a simple uh, bubble chart. And boom, it's like really, really powerful. And then you see his insight, how he delivers the information, how he starts out with a simple question, how he builds on that question to understand some historical background, how he shows uh, the current situation and then projects out into the future. 
So it's a great example of how you can use visualization to educate, to not just enable to understand, but educate on something new, to teach your audience something they probably didn't know when they started looking at your visualizations. The next one is Stephen Few. I mentioned him earlier on. Um, you want to empower. So you enable them to understand, to see what you see. You educate them on things they didn't know. And then you empower them to do things, to take action, to go out and use your data to do something. So if you use this process, this is what I, the core of what I teach when it comes to uh, working with data is you enable, you educate, and you empower. And when you do those things, and people are going to be able to go out and be much more um, effective with the information that you shared with them. Um, I talked about this in my previous talk, and I won't go into it too much, but if you haven't watched that, um, I go through the key elements of data storytelling. So if you're at a point where you're the one presenting your data, if you're the one that is in front of the room, whether it be virtually or in person, and you are the primary way people are going to get information and then make decisions off that information, then you need to be employing data storytelling as a technique. It is the number one most in-demand skill in the corporate world um, as far as uh, analytics. If you can do the nerd stuff and then make it make it make that nerd data stuff make sense to the layman, to the average person, then you'd be more successful. This is what made me successful at Wells Fargo was that I could take all this data and boil it down into a simple narrative that my boss could understand without him having to ever open up a spreadsheet. He could make really key decisions based on my analysis. I talk about that in detail in the data storytelling talk I gave before. So um, pretty much uh, that's it. Um, I know I went through that really fast. I've got you know a few minutes left for any questions, um, but I wanna thank you for your time. Um, please follow me on YouTube if you want to learn more about um, what I do. Um, now go out there and visualize some data. Thanks very much, Dan. Super helpful as students start to take that data and figure out how to, to visualize it. I'm going to throw it out to the, the students and alums. Does anyone have any questions? There was one question on, um, oh, any yeah. any tips on, oh, you can read it as well, sorry. Yeah, Go ahead, yeah. sorry. No, great, thank you. So Tableau, um, it's got the, the best thing about Tableau is the network, is the user base, right? So Tableau does like, you know, they have the Viz of the Week contest they do. Um, they have a really deep user community that's active on the Tableau um, chat in the Tableau uh, area. The tutorials they have are great. Um, there's some amazing experts out there on YouTube. So if you just, you know, type in Tableau expert on YouTube and you'll see the ones that have the most followers and the most, you know, videos, check them out. Um, the, the best advice I can give you with Tableau is just keep doing it, right? So it takes person, I'd say about a month um, of using Tableau every day to get to be a, a close to expertise, right? It's a lot of trial and error a lot of asking opinions, a lot of figuring things out. Some people say Tableau is not very intuitive um, to the beginner. Um, and I think that may be true because it's a lot of dragging and dropping. It doesn't look uh, on the data side like traditional databases. Um, when you do the table joins and you're trying to figure out things, it could be a little overwhelming. Um, so with Tableau, just you know, give yourself a month to apply uh, learning something new every, every day. And, and you'll get there, but it takes time. And, and um, there are many experts out there. So the last thing you wanna do is be the only one on your team using Tableau. If that's the case, then you have to find a mentor or an expert or somebody that can help help you learn it. Cause it's really, really hard to, to pick up quickly if you're not constantly engaging with experts. So Excel is useful for for dashboards, um, I've used it many times. I, I, I have a dashboard I use in Excel um, with my team. And, and basically um, what we're doing with Excel uh, is just simplifying it, right? So Excel is good if you have your data is in Excel and you just wanna make some quick you know, dashboards that have a four or five visuals that you can display. Um, that's really the way to go. Uh, if you wanna do more, then you can do in Excel. You want to use things in Tableau like the storyboarding. Um, you want to use maps. Uh, there's things that Tableau can do that Excel can't. But I would say that if in a lot of cases, Excel is good enough. 
um, it, it's really, what are you trying to do above and beyond? A lot of people have invested in Tableau um, and wasted it because they end up doing an Excel anyway, because Tableau is a little more complicated, a little less common. There's not as many experts out there. Um, so people kind of, they purchase it, they get it, they don't use it, they go back to Excel, that happens. So um, I would only say, you know, move away from Excel to Tableau if you need to use some of the features Tableau has that Excel doesn't. Like publishing things. Like that one thing you can do with Tableau, obviously, is you can publish to the cloud. You can like uh, share things across different organizations pretty quickly. Um, Excel, you, still, you can do some of that. They've actually upgraded Excel so much in the last few years because of what they've lost in market share because of these visualization tools like Tableau. Um, but still, I think most people are, I mean, Excel's been around for close to 30 years now and it's not going anywhere, so. All right. Yes, cover the basics, learn the basics. The only, again, the best thing about Tableau is the mapping. That's the one thing that no other visualization tool comes close to. Um, if you're gonna do any kind of mapping in your presentations, demographically, um, uh, geography, you know, uh, things like where you wanna show, you know, just region by region, um, Tableau is, is the best, but uh, yeah, cool. So uh, any other questions? All right. I think um, that's about it. Cool. Thanks so much, Bev. I had a blast. As always, I love speaking with the. Uh, oh, there's uh, one more question. One more question. In the, in the last two minutes, how can we use things like storyboarding to increase productivity? So storyboarding should be used to explain a narrative. So you have several visuals that you would normally put in a dashboard, but there has to be some kind of context. There has to be explanation that's when you use storyboarding. So if you're trying, trying to increase or enhance productivity, um, it's because you're looking at a data point and then you need to put some kind of context to it. Like say, for example, you have uh, uh, people doing um, a certain task and you can show how many did X number of widgets, how much time it took, you can show all these things, but is that good or bad? Is that something that you're trying to improve? Is that something that you're looking to understand why? Then that may be where you put in the narrative around a storyboard. So Tableau's got that storyboarding feature. Um, it's like a step towards data storytelling. It can be used for data storytelling, um, but basically you wanna think again, does your visual tell a story that your audience needs to know on its own? If it needs context, if it needs explanation, then you would use um, a storyboard versus a dashboard. I mean, sorry, if, if your dashboard tells things on their own without people having to understand it. Again, it's like, how, how, how deep is the knowledge of your audience? Does your audience really get the, um, the data without you having to uh, really understand it um, beyond what they see? Or is there something you have to add for them to understand it? If there needs to be narrative, do it in a storyboard. Okay. Thank you very much for, for speaking us, to us today on data visualization, super helpful. Um, yeah, and really appreciate your, your time. Have a good flight, good luck in this next speaker series that you're doing. Awesome, I'm looking forward to it. Cool, thank well, you so much. Bev, I'll talk to you soon. Everyone have a good uh, rest of your day. Great, thanks very much, take care. Bye.